Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the first in a hopefully uh, not too long series of purely online seminars hosted by the Consortium for Research on Terrorism and International Crime. Uh, my name is Ole Martin Stormon. Uh, I'm the co coordinator for the Consortium seminars and also a junior research fellow at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs here in Oslo. Uh, the short um, description of the consortium, uh, it has existed since 2002 and it consists of uh, Norwegian at the, uh, Institute of Inter International Affairs, uh, NUPI, uh, the Norwegian Defence Research Establishment, uh, more commonly known as FFI, uh, the Police University College, uh, POS, and the Centre for Research uh, on Extremism at the University of Oslo. Um, the managing director of the consortium is Rita Augusta Knudsen, a senior research fellow here at NUPI, and the academic director is Professor Tor Bjørgo from CIRIX at the University of Oslo. Um, first, some practical information. Um, as most of our normal seminars, uh, this uh, seminar will also be recorded and absent any major uh, issues or hiccups along the way, it will also be posted to our uh, NUPI's own YouTube channel. Um, our plan for the coming hour is as follows. Uh, after this brief introduction, we'll have two presentations. And after the presentations, um, we'll have a short Q&A session. Uh, you, if you have any questions as we go along, you can post them in the Q&A part of the Teams app, which should be on the right-hand side of your screens. Um, and and we'll, we'll do our best to gather all, all, all the questions and, and direct them to our invited experts uh, in the Q&A session. Um, the title of today's seminar is uh, Jihad in the Sahel, uh, Actors, Developments and Context. Um, many parts of the Sahel, um, an area roughly the size of India, um, have over the last decade or so seen uh, the rise of several uh, different uh, jihadi insur insurgent groups, uh, groups which have managed to, uh, to take advantage of the existing tensions and conflicts in the area. Uh, and often revealing the respective government's uh, inability to protect their own citizens. Uh, the worst thing, uh, the, the, uh, during the last years, the situation has, has, has worsened uh, and we have seen several attacks uh, and hundreds of civilians and government forces have been killed in, in attacks conducted by insurgent groups uh, linked to the Islamic State or, and or Al Qaeda. Uh, the worsening situation has led the international community to commit um, troops uh, into uh, operations led by the African Union, the European Union uh, and also the United Nations. And in addition, France, uh, with support from the US, have, have acted more aggressively uh, to combat the, the jihadis uh, uh, and also uh, expanded the operations uh, to the use of armed drones to patrol the vast areas where the jihadis operate. So today we ask who are these jihadis? Uh, why are they gaining ground? And what are the likely near-term near developments uh, in the various conflicts in the Sahel? Uh, we've invited Vida Skatting and, and, and Alessio Iocchi to answer these questions and to explain the role of jihadi groups in the deteriorating security situations in, in the Sahel and to help us navigate the complex landscape of groups, affiliations and the various contexts in which they operate. Uh, the first presenter is FFE's Vida Skatting. Uh, he is a PhD fellow at FFE. Uh, his research focuses on jihadism in the Sahel region uh, as part of uh, FFE's long-running terror project. Uh, Vida will give a presentation of the jihadi actors involved in the conflict, focusing on uh, the so-called JNIM uh, and the ex Islamic State in the Greater Sahara the regional affiliates of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, respectively. Uh, he'll give an overview of the history and status of the two groups and discuss developments over the past year. Uh, so with that, I will give the um, microphone uh, to Vida and uh, his presentation um, uh, for the next 20 or 25 minutes or so. Hello, good morning. Hi. Can you see the presentation? Uh, I'll send it live now. Fantastic. Okay, 
Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, as Ola Martin already said, and as you can see, uh, I will be speaking about JNIM and ISGS, which are Al-Qaeda's and Islamic State affiliates in the Central Sahel region. The plan for the presentation is as follows. Um, I will begin by giving a quick overview of the ongoing conflict in the Sahel uh, and sketch out the broad lines of what's happened in the region since the rebellion broke out in northern Mali in 2012. Uh, after this brief overview, we'll have a closer look at the two main jihadist factions in the region, their history and the way in which they've operated. Finally, I will discuss some of the recent developments that have taken place within the Sahelian jihadist scene uh, and what the consequences of these might be. So uh, beginning with the overview, um, the Sahel region can be defined in many different ways, uh, but in this presentation, I will focus on the central Sahel region, uh, by which I mean the countries of Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso. And this region has been beset by wide ranging security challenges over the past years. Today's conflict can trace its origins back to 2012, when Tuareg separatists in Mali rebelled against the central government in order to create an independent state in northern Mali. This rebellion was initiated and led by secular separatist groups, uh, but these decided to cooperate with various Al Qaeda affiliated jihadist groups who were also willing to take up arms against the Malian government. The separatists and the jihadists took control over northern Mali in 2012 as allies, uh, but this marriage of convenience between jihadists and separatists uh, broke down soon afterwards. After a period of infighting, the jihadists emerged victorious and northern Mali was declared an Islamic emirate or an Islamic state, if you like, under jihadist control. In January of 2013, the jihadists in northern Mali launched a military offensive into central Mali. In response, the Malian government requested military aid from France. So the French military intervened uh, and the intervention defeated the jihadists in, in northern Mali uh, and put an end to this so-called uh, Islamic Emirate in, in relatively short time. And uh, as you're probably aware, the French forces are still present in Mali and in the wider region. Um, and there has also been established a UN peacekeeping force in Mali. Uh, and the French military intervention weakened the jihadist movement in the region for some time. However, from 2015, there has been a resurgence of jihadist activity in the Sahel. Uh, there has been a steady increase in jihadist violence every year since then. Moreover, the jihadist networks have also seen a significant geographic spread in, in this period. While in 2012 and 2013, jihadist activity was overwhelmingly centered in northern Mali, the epicenter has now moved further, further south to central Mali, northern Burkina Faso and western Niger. Um, and the situation in, in the Sahel region today remains chaotic. Um, local security forces appear ill-equipped to restore order um, and the intensity of the violence has increased significantly over the past few years. According to numbers from the United Nations, more than 4,000 people were killed in violent attacks in the three countries in 2019 alone, which amounts to a five-fold increase in just three years. And in addition to jihadists, there are also a variety of other non-state non armed actors that contribute to the violence in the region. Uh, but that lies somewhat outside of the scope of this presentation, uh, where we will focus on the two main jihadist groups namely JNIM and ISGS, uh, which we'll take a closer look at now. So moving first to JNIM, uh, this group is the official branch of Al-Qaeda in the Sahel region. Uh, JNIM is an Arabic acronym for Jama'at Nusratul Islam al Muslimin, uh, which translates roughly to the group in support of Islam and Muslims. And the establishment of the group was announced in March 2017 um, as a merger or umbrella organization for the various Al Qaeda affiliated jihadi groups in the Sahel. Um, and the constituent groups of JNIM are first uh, AQIM, so that's the um, uh, that's Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, so their branch in the Sahara, which originates from AQIM's networks in in Algeria. And second, we have Al Murabitoun, which originated as, as another AQIM dissident group. Ansar Din, which is a jihadist group mainly uh, composed of fighters from the Tuareg ethnic group 
uh, based in northern Mali. Uh, and this group was founded by Iyad Agrali, uh, who is now also the leader of JNIM uh, as a whole. Uh, and you can see him in the middle of, of the, the uh, top right picture. Uh, and finally, uh, we have Katibat Masina. Uh, this group has recruited primarily, although not, not exclusively, from the Fulani ethnic group in the central Mali. Katibat Masina is headed by Amadou Kufa, who you can see uh, to the left in the same picture. Um, and this subgroup in particular has been instrumental in extending the geographical reach of JNIM into central and southern Mali, uh, as well as to Burkina Faso. And the other main group operating in the region is IFGS, uh, short for the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara. Like many other IS groups around the globe, ISGS began as a split in an Al-Qaeda affiliated group. In the case of ISGS, the group emerged following an internal struggle in Al Murabitun, where Abu Wid al Sahrawi, one of the commanders of the group, pledged allegiance to IS leader Abu Bakr al Baghdadi in 2015. However, the other main faction of, of uh, Al Murabitun, led by Mukhtar al Mukhtar, uh, denied that al Sahrawi had spoken on behalf of the whole group and reaffirmed his own allegiance to Al Qaeda. Um, this led to a split in the group where Al Mukhtar's faction would eventually realign with AQIM, uh, while Al Sahrawi's faction became ISGS. And for the first few years of ISGS's existence, uh, the group's connection with IS central leadership appeared to be weak or almost non existent. Al Sahrawi's pledge of allegiance to IS was, was only acknowledged uh, a full year and a half after it was given. And after that, uh, ISGS disappeared from, uh, from IS official propaganda and communication. And despite the fact that ISGS later conducted attacks with significant propaganda value, um, such as the Tongo Tongo ambush in, in October 2017, uh, that killed four American soldiers as well as five Nigerian, um, this attack was not mentioned in IS propaganda at the time. Um, ISJS was also not recognized as a separate wilaya or province by IS in 2016, as, I had, I, as the Islamic State has often done uh, when a group in a new region has joined the organizations. Uh, as we'll see in a bit, uh, all of this changed last year. We'll now turn to look at how JNIM and ISGS have operated in the region. Well, in terms of ideology and propaganda, uh, the groups are connected to the rhetoric of global jihad, uh, common both to Al Qaeda and, and uh, the Islamic State. Um, on a practical level, it makes sense to regard them as insurgent groups with a primarily local agenda. The majority of fighters are, are recruited locally, and almost all attacks are also carried out in the region. Neither group has launched terrorist attacks in the West, uh, nor does that seem to be a priority to either group. The jihadist presence and attack activity uh, has been most visible in rural, rural areas uh, outside of the capitals and major cities. In many of these areas, uh, the control of the central government has been weak and trust in state institutions has also been low, even before the current conflict. Um, many of the local communities experience uh, extreme poverty, underdevelopment um, and a feeling that the state has left them behind. And jihadists have, in many of these areas, managed to tap into these local grievances uh, and anti-state sentiments to find support. And their basic strategy on a local level has been to systematically attack state security forces and seeking to eradicate on other symbols of the state and local authority. As the government presence is, is thus further weakened, um, jihadists have been able to exercise some degree of control on the local level in many areas across the region. So that does not mean that jihadists have taken control over major population centers or that they exercise direct territorial control uh, to the extent that they did in northern Mali in 2012. But in the absence of a strong state and with security forces struggling to maintain control, both JNIM and ISGS have been able to penetrate local communities where they can raise money, uh, recruit new followers uh, and build trust through providing basic services and administering justice. Another way in which both JNIM and ISGS have won support is through involving themselves in existing local conflicts. 
this is a huge and complex issue in itself, uh, but without going into too much detail on this, uh, we can say that there does exist a range of conflicts on a local level throughout the Sahel uh, over various issues, such as access to land and resources. Um, and often uh, these conflicts pit one ethnic group against another. These conflicts are highly localized and have little to do with jihadism in the first place. Um, however, in some of these cases, uh, jihadists have taken the side of one party to a conflict um, and provided arms, manpower and protection, which has allowed them to gain some sympathy um, as well as opportunities to recruit in these communities. The flip side is, of course, uh, that communities or individuals that refuse to cooperate here uh, are targeted in uh, jihadist attacks. So the point we've been made here is that the jihadists in the Sahel, uh, both RSGS and JNIM, are profoundly local in their orientation. And part of their success lies in the fact that they've been, that they've been able to graft a jihadist narrative over pre-existing conflicts and grievances. That said, uh, none of these approach or approaches are in themselves unique to the Sahel. Jihadist groups all have similarly worked to co-opt local conflicts and grievances um, in other theatres ac across the globe. What does the Sahel apart, however, um, is that even though JNIM and ISGS operate in many of the same territories, uh, we have not seen the same level of enmity and open warfare between Al Qaeda and IS factions as we've seen in other theatres, for example, in Syria and Iraq, Yemen or Libya. On the contrary, uh, the two groups uh, appear to have, for the most part, accepted each other's presence. Um, and according to you and, uh, and other reports, um, there has existed even some degree of cooperation between them. This unique Sahelian state of affairs uh, with relative peace between JNIM and ISGS appears to be changing. Um, and I will talk more about that in a minute. So after this brief overview of the situation and of the groups in question, uh, we will now turn to some of the recent developments that have taken place within the jihadist scene. Um, and we'll start by looking at ISGS. As mentioned, um, ISGS did not figure in uh, IS publications after al Sahrawi's Pledge of Allegiance was accepted in 2016. Um, and it seemed that contact between ISGS and IS Central was, was at a minimal for many years. But at the end of March 2019, images of IS fighters in Burkina Faso uh, appear on IS propaganda channels, uh, which you can see here on the right. A few days later, another, uh, which is IS's weekly newspaper, if you can call it that, um, had several pages of reports on ISGS. Um, here, uh, IS assumed responsibility for several attacks. Uh, both from far back in time, such as the Tonga Tonga attack uh, on, on US soldiers uh, that I mentioned previously, but also attacks that took place relatively shortly before the, the, this report was released. And since then, uh, ISGS has featured regularly in pro propaganda distributed by IS channels. They have claimed responsibility for attacks relatively shortly after they've occurred, and this indicates that the communication lines with IS have become more established. One important thing to note here is uh, that ISGS has not been declared a separate wilaya or province, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, however, uh, IS Central tends to claim responsibility for attacks that have taken place through one of its provinces. And in the case of ISGS, uh, they are referred to as part of the Islamic State's West Africa province. Um, as I'm sure Alessia will talk about in more detail later, uh, this group, uh, the, the West African province, is an offshoot of Boko Haram and is active in northeastern Nigeria and, and around Lake Chad. Um, in any case, uh, this means that ISGS, at least from a propaganda standpoint, is administratively subject to the West African province. Um, thus far, um, I've seen no strong evidence that, that there is close contact or direct operational cooperation between the two groups. Uh, but the fact that ISGS is now officially part of the West African province indicates that this might be an ambition in the long term. In parallel with this realignment with the rest of the Islamic State organization, um, ISGS has proved itself uh, far more effective on the battlefield in 2019 and 2020 uh, than in previous years. 
Since April of last year, ISGS has carried out major attacks against the military forces of Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso alike. Um, I will not go into great detail on, on each of these attacks, but I've listed some of the major ones that have happened just over the past few months, uh, which represent some of the biggest losses the national armies have suffered since the beginning of the conflict. An attack such as these has made it clear that IFGS is emerging as a major threat in the region, where, where usually JNIM has been considered the most uh, potent uh, jihadist group. Um, it is too early to say whether IFGS will in fact represent a greater threat in the long term, uh, but it is worth noting that France and the so-called G5 countries uh, declared in January of this, uh, of this year um, at the, the military summit in Pau in France, uh, that ISGS would be the prioritized target for their uh, upcoming military operations. As for JNIM, uh, this group has also managed to maintain a high operational uh, tempo over the past year. Um, however, uh, the group also appears to be facing some internal divisions, which appears to in part derive from the challenge presented by, by, uh, by the rise of ISGS. And there are several indications of this. Uh, the most obvious is, of course, that uh, JNIM militants are, are defecting to ISGS. Uh, so, for example, on, on the 31st of January of this year, uh, a group of what was in all likelihood JNIM fighters in Nampala in Mali uh, released a video in which they de declared their allegiance to the Islamic State. Uh, while this incident has been the hitherto most public defection to ISGS, there have also been reports of JNIM fighters defecting to ISGS in, uh, in other places. Um, and alongside these reports, there have been reports of violent clashes between JNIM and defectors to ISGS, uh, which we will come back to in a moment. But um, this in itself is not a wholly new phenomenon. Uh, there have been other JNIM aligned units that have defected to ISGS over the past few years as well. Um, but the response from JNIM suggests that this is an issue that is being taken seriously. So um, while JNIM itself has not directly commented on any internal divisions, um, it's in, it is interesting to see that they released this, this document that you can see on the right. Um, uh, this is a statement directed to people, uh, without specifying who, uh, that claim JNIM uh, does not implement the Sharia to the extent that it should. So um, they defend themselves in this statement by, by, by saying that they do wish to implement the Sharia, but, but only gradually and not in a way that will alienate uh, potential support or, or take away from the prime objective, uh, which is to fight the, the, uh, the Kufar, um, the, the non-believers. In other words, uh, they advocate for a pragmatic approach to implementing the Sharia. Um, and this issue of how and when to implement the Sharia um, is a perennial one within the jihadist sphere. Um, it is, moreover, um, a common thread in the discourses between Al-Qaeda and IS, uh, where the latter usually advocates for a more direct, uh, hardline approach. So despite the fact that the statement is not directly addressed to anyone, um, the fact that they release this statement at all, and especially at this time, uh, suggests um, that there are, that, that JNIM is responding to criticisms, um, either from ISGS, or, or from potential IS sympathizers within their own ranks. Another major development in recent times uh, is that the Malian government has publicly acknowledged reaching out to JNIM leaders, uh, Yad Akrali and Amadou Koufa, um, and indicated that they're willing to negotiate with them. And this offer by the Malian government was not rejected out of hand. Instead, uh, JNIM responded with a statement saying that they were ready to enter negotiations with the, with the Malian government to end the fighting, uh, but with one precondition, uh, namely that the French and UN forces leave the country first. It is a bit unclear what either side hopes to achieve in such a negotiation. Um, it, it is difficult to envisage how either of the two sides could agree to a political settlement that would also be palatable to the other. Um, in any case, um, it is interesting to note Jen, JNIM's response uh, and the way in which it's worded. So first of all, JNIM's statement comes at a point where there has been increasing discontent among, um, among the Malian people with the French military presence in the country. 
In January this year, uh, thousands took to the streets in Mali's capital, Bamako, uh, to demonstrate against the French presence in the country. Um, and there have also been demonstrations other places in Mali against the French and also against the UN peacekeeping mission. So with this statement, JNIM taps into this simmering anti-French sentiment and portrays the French as the main obstacle to peace. Uh, they make explicit reference to the, to the demonstrations uh, and they say that they're on the side of the demonstrators and the Malian people in, in this whole issue. And they furthermore portray the whole conflict as one between an oppressed Malian people uh, on the one side and a French occupying force on the other. So uh, on one level it is clearly intended to sow further discord between the people of Mali and the French. The obvious danger to JNM's uh, strategy, however, uh, is that by opening the door for negotiations, however improbable it is that negotiations will lead to a peace settlement, um, it simultaneously uh, opens itself up to criticisms from hardliners within the jihadist sphere. Uh, for, example, from J for example, from ISGS uh, and others uh, who would view any, any, um, any permanent settlement with a secular government um, as a betrayal of the, the jihadi line. Um, and considering that JNIM already appears to experience some dissension within its own ranks, uh, this might prove to be a, a, a dangerous strategy. So to draw things together now towards the end, uh, we might ask if we are witnessing the end of this unusual and anomalous situation in the Sahel, where Al-Qaeda and IS factions have left each other alone and focused on common enemies. As we have seen already, there have been signs of increasing divergence between the outlook and strategies of JNIM and ISGS. Uh, we've seen how differences have emerged over the issue of how to implement the Sharia, um, and also on the issue of the legality of negotiating peace with the Malian government. We can add to this also the issue of what constitutes a legitimate target for attacks, uh, where we've also seen divergence be between the two groups. Um, so JNIM has released, statement, released statements uh, where it claims that it only attacks local and international military forces, um, and where it disavows attacks against civilians, both uh, Muslim and Christian. Uh, ISGS, on the other hand, does claim responsibility for attacks against Christians and, and celebrates such attacks in, in their propaganda. But most importantly, um, there has been an increasing number of, of, uh, of reports of clashes between JNIM and ISGS fighters. Um, as mentioned previously, there were reports of small scale clashes between uh, JNIM members and defectors to ISGS earlier this year in mid January. Um, and local media has reported that other clashes have occurred also over the past few months. But this low intensity fighting appears to have intensified just over the past few weeks. So uh, Akhled reports that over 100 jihadists were killed in clashes between JNIM and ISGS uh, in the Mokti region of Mali uh, on the 5th of April. Um, and just last week, as you can see on the PowerPoint here, uh, local media reported that 60 jihadists were killed uh, in, in clashes in northern Burkina Faso. So considering the mounting differences between JNIM and ISGS, and also the recent clashes between them, it appears increasingly likely that the relative peace that has existed between the two, group, uh, between the two groups uh, is coming apart. Um, and the more clashes that occur, uh, the prospect of returning to the, the previous status quo between the two groups becomes less likely. So to end this presentation, I will briefly sum up some of the main points we've been through. First, uh, the security situation in the Sahel remains chaotic and is deteriorating. Especially over the past year, JNIM and ISGS have gained ground. Uh, and the casualty numbers have been skyrocketing uh, and the national armies have suffered some very significant losses in jihadist attacks. At the same time, uh, the rise that ISGS has recently seen appears to be one contributing factor to increased tensions between the two groups. And with the numerous reports that significant violent clashes are taking place, uh, it seems increasingly likely that the unusual situation of having one Al-Qaeda and one IS group operating side by side in relative peace is coming to an end, which perhaps will provide some respite to the forces that are fighting these two uh, jihadist groups in the Sahel. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vita. Uh, I'm sure there will be uh, several interesting questions uh, following uh, your, your great presentation. Uh, we've received numerous uh, questions so far, so keep posting questions. And as many of you have already noticed, you can uh, like questions and, 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 and thereby send them to the top of the list of questions uh, for the Q&A session. Um, our next presenter is uh, Alessio Iocchi. Uh, he is a senior research fellow here at NUPI in the in the research group on peace, conflict, and development. He holds a PhD from in contemporary African history from the University of Naples uh, L'Orientale and works predominantly on non-state armed groups, insurgencies, social mobilization, and the informal economy in the Sahel and the Sahara, a region where he has conducted in-depth uh, field work. Um, uh, Alessio's presentation offers a detailed description of the specific context uh, in the Lake uh, Chad Basin, uh, an area that hosts both uh, the Islamic State's West Africa province, uh, as well as uh, the group formerly and more commonly known as Boko Haram. Uh, he'll explain the emergence of the Islamic State's West Africa province and describe the, the main developments of the last year. In the second part, he will offer his analysis of both groups' power networks in, in, in the basin and the basis of their claims to authority. Um, with that, I will uh, give the word to uh, Alessio uh, and his presentation. OK. Can you see the presentation? Um, uh, it should be. There no. we are. Yeah. OK, so thank you very much for joining us in this uh, experiment and thanks. Big thanks to Ule Martin for organizing. And uh, after Vidar's brilliant overview of what's going on uh, in Niger and Mali, we will now move to a completely different area, uh, the lecture basin, which uh, we need to uh, to to view. This is this is a map of the uh, geographical location of the Lake Chad, which as you can see is uh, right in the middle of Africa. Uh, and uh, it's a body of water composed mostly of uh, lagunar and uh, lagunar, lagunar areas and swamps. And uh, its body of water is dotted with several islands which have these um, uh, interesting features which are floating islands and uh, they may host also uh, training camps and madrasa camps, but we will see these things uh, later on. This is just to give you um, uh, a panoramic view of what's going on, of what uh, is the location of uh, Lake Chad, which as you can see is a transnational space because it is divided between uh, four different um, countries uh, due to uh, uh, reasons of uh, colonial decoupage, and um, it is now administered by the by four states, so Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, and Chad. And uh, as you can see from this map, um, there is also a, a small picture so that you can visualize that um, more correctly. And um, this is the main area of operation of, uh, of uh, Isla Islamic State West Africa province, uh, which is the, the wilaya of, uh, of the caliphate and, um, and the group commonly known uh, as uh, Boko Haram and, uh, and its affiliates. But let's start from scratch and uh, we, need to, we need to understand what is this Boko Haram phenomenon. And uh, as for Boko Haram phenomenon is what I what I it's a catch all label which I developed in my articles and papers just to describe uh, the emergence of a strand of um, jihadi prone uh, Salafi leaning uh, um, uh, preachers and scholars and uh, and increasingly of course fighters which developed during the, the late 90s due to uh, to the uh, to the success we uh, we can say of the of the Salafi Dawa from, from northern Nigeria, especially if not exclusively, um, uh, this uh, this was developed uh, right in connection between uh, the late 90s and early 2000s of the so-called uh, Sharia politics period in Nigeria, in which several several northern Nigerian states, uh, Muslim majority ones, uh, have adopted Sharia in their penal code. 
And uh, during the same period, um, a, a small, extremely small uh, scattered um, wave of uh, Nigeria based fighters um, started to merge and integrate in different uh, insurgencies throughout West Africa and beyond. Uh, during this period, uh, one of the most important uh, Salafi scholars in Nigeria emerged, and uh, his name is uh, Muhammad Yusuf, uh, Ustaz Muhammad Yusuf. Um, he, he was a scholar of this uh, Salafi, um, Salafi leaning uh, groups called Halus Sunnah. And uh, he is most noted for being the informal uh, beginner of the uh, of the Boko Haram insurgency, of the so-called Boko Haram insurgency. Uh, why was he the beginner? Because in uh, after several setbacks with uh, local authorities and uh, federal authorities uh, in Nigeria, from his home base of Maiduguri in uh, northeastern uh, Nigeria in the state of Borno. Uh, which is uh, directly on Lake Chad, uh, Mohamed Yusuf started, um, attempted to start an uprising, which was thwarted heavily and bloodily uh, by the Nigerian security forces and uh, leading to his murder, his unlawful murder, and um, he became, in fact, the first martyr of the uh, Boko Haram insurgency. After uh, his uprising was thwarted in 2009, July 2009, right before the, the beginning of Ramadan, um, his, uh, his remnants, um, his former followers uh, scattered all around West Africa, going as far as Algeria. And in 2010, uh, just one year after uh, this uprising, um, one of his former followers, one of uh, Yusuf's former followers, um, the infamous Imam uh, Abu Bakr Shekau, uh, regrouped most of the former uh, followers of Yusuf and uh, gave it a home, let's say, uh, with this organization, uh, which everybody calls it the, the Boko Haram, and uh, but it's uh, it's a formal brand is Jamahadu uh, Al Sunnah Lidawari Wal Jihad, which is right from the name is the is connected to the Al Sunnah group, which I mentioned earlier in northern Nigeria, with uh, the interesting features that they will focus on. Uh, yes, of course, on Dawa, but uh, but uh, most interestingly on Jihad. Uh, this group started to develop connections with uh, the, 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 the organization uh, operating in, in uh, West Africa, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, or ACNI. Um, but uh, right, uh, right in the middle of the negotiations for uh, the developing of the insurgency and which kind of targets and the strategies would be adopted, uh, uh, the, the, the Nigerian Mujahid, uh, Mujahideen uh, started to quell and uh, dissent, and uh, a press split occurred in 2012 uh, with the formation of the group which is commonly known as Ansar, which uh, interestingly uh, became dormant uh, just one year after its formation or after its formal um, emergence. And so it's dormant since 2013. Even though uh, during the November and the December 2019, it started to emerge with a couple of uh, attacks in uh, in the northwestern Nigeria, so in another part. Um, but uh, we have to understand this, uh, let's say, more or less complex uh, landscape, uh, because uh, from this landscape. Uh, emerged the group that we know as the, the, the Caliphate's West African Wilaya. And uh, everything started with, uh, with the Caliphate declaration incident in Iraq by al-Baghdadi in June 2014. Uh, even though um, uh, one would assume that this was a, a, positive, um, uh, a positive result of, uh, of, the, of the global jihad insurgency, uh, the issue caused several, uh, several um, discussions and debates and rifts eventually. And uh, the, most important, uh, the, mo the most important issues at stake were uh, the conflicting visions about uh, the practice of excommunication uh, or takfir. And, uh, because, and uh, uh, the degree of uh, inclusivism or exclusivism, uh, exclusivism uh, that should be practiced by the group. This uh, doctrinal rift 
paralleled with the strategic rift. And, um, and a dissenting group, which was led by Ustaz Muhammad Yusuf, youngest surviving son, um, Habib Yusuf, whose kunya or, uh, or war name, Nom de Guerre, is uh, Abu Musab al Barnawi. And uh, we will refer to him as Abu Musab from there on. Uh, championed the dissenting group, and uh, and along with uh, with the with the group's main strategist Mama Nur, uh, which is originally from Lake Chad, um, they they started separate negotiation with the Islamic State Central. I mean, with the Caliphate, and uh, and uh, were able uh, to uh, to push uh, Caliph al Baghdadi to endorse them and uh, dismiss uh, Abu Bakr as Shekawi uh, as Wali of the Wilaya in West Africa. And in 2016, it offici officially emerged as the Islamic State West Africa province or ISWAP. And, uh, and uh, after uh, some good developments um, in terms of uh, local governance integration uh, of ISWAP, uh, starting from uh, from late 2017 and early 2018, the group started to um, to face several internal driftings. Uh, rifts. Um, these rifts led to uh, power uh, power uh, discussions and uh, um, doctrinal uh, at diverging doctrinal attitudes. Um, and in the end, in August 2018, uh, the main ISWAP main strategist uh, was executed for treason because he was willing to accept the amnesty offered by the Nigerian federal government. And uh, despite this, and despite the close connection between uh, Abu Musab and uh, Maman Nur, uh, Abu Musab retained his position as Wali or as a leader. Uh, but not for so long, uh, since uh, last year, just one year ago, in March 2019, Abu Busab was sacked by ISIS Central or uh, the Caliphate and replaced by a former um, follower of uh, Muhammad Yusuf, an all-time guy uh, from Maiduguri, and uh, whose name is uh, Baidrissa. Uh, Baidrissa retained his position up to uh, a very recent time, uh, up to March 2020, when uh, so last month, uh, when he was sacked, and according to several reliable sources, uh, possibly executed um, for no specific reason, but is uh, is suspected for treason as well, and replaced by another all-time uh, all-time uh, leader and uh, former Yusuf uh, follower, uh, whose name is Balawan which um, apparently is now the uh, the leader of the or wali uh, of, of his of the of the islamic state west africa province but during this uh, internal rifting rifts and setbacks which occurred uh, within iswap council or shura uh, the group led by imam abu bakar al shaka which we left some slides ago uh, uh, boosted this presence and uh, and started to reorganize and reemerge uh, thanks to um, to several uh, loyalist commanders which started to organize and uh, op operate attacks in in an area which which uh, which was um, slightly far from uh, from the core field operation area of Imam Al Shakawi. Um, we are talking, of course, of the Lake Chad. And uh, for instance, the most important recent events, uh, recent event the, that, uh, that, that occurred linked to uh, JAS or Boko Haram, is the uh, attack operated against the, uh, the Chadian National Army base in, uh, in, a, in a locality, in a, in a Lake Chad peninsula uh, called Buhuma. Uh, which occurred just on the 23 of March of last March 2020. Uh, this this attack was operated by by uh, a loyalist Shekau commander, known simply as uh, Bakura uh, or Ibrahim Bakura, which uh, was apparently also killed sometime before the attack. So someone came to replace him, even though we don't know who. And uh, but 
Nonetheless, uh, the, this attack led to the death of 98 Chadian soldiers. So the, bloody, the bloodiest uh, attack occurred on Chadian territory in, the, in its entire history. And um, this is this, of course, uh, recorded is uh, is is striking capability, and uh, the fact that it is not uh, is not waning. In this slide, we can see the uh, geographical distribution. I know that it is not really up to date, and uh, it, uh, it it is of 2018, but more or less, uh, despite some changes and some some uh, effective operations of, uh, by the Nigerian security forces and uh, the multinational joint task force, which is operated by the four Riparian countries. Uh, this more or less gives you the, the, the geographical distribution of the groups. Uh, the red dots uh, are ISWAP and uh, the purple dots are JIS or Boko Haram. As you can see, ISWAP is, uh, is, uh, is uh, is mostly present uh, in the in the rural areas between Nigeria, Niger, and Chad, while uh, JS or Boko Haram is uh, mostly present in the rural areas um, between Nigeria and Cameroon in the in an area called the, the Mandara Mountains. Uh, the both are are extremely difficult to access uh, for uh, security forces and uh, of course also for NGOs and as of course, for for civilians, which are trying to flee uh, these areas or trying to um, to reach for help. And um, uh, now that we talked about the the the, the, the geographical setting and the social space of operations, we need to understand uh, in which way the Lake Chad Basin uh, presents some interesting futures. Um, the Lake Chad Basin area, uh, as we have seen, uh, is, a, is a multinational area, which used to be in pre-colonial time uh, a unified uh, political, uh, political uh, actor, uh, the Kanem-Bornu Empire. And uh, during the, the colonial conquest by French, British, Germans, and uh, it came to be divided and uh, it lost uh, is, is economic centrality. Thereon, uh, the space has developed uh, in a highly segmented society with a strong hierarchical structure in terms of class and labor division. And uh, from a central, uh, from a central empire uh, enjoying um, enjoying uh, wealth and and, uh, and uh, political power, uh, it became a peripheral area. And uh, nowadays, since uh, nowadays, uh, the, 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 four, the four states, Nigeria, Chad, Cameroon and Niger, um, they enjoy very, very low, very poor legitimacy in the area in terms of, um, of uh, justice administration, which is extremely complex, um, providing education. Uh, so far, uh, only, only few schools have, have, have been set up in the area by the four countries. And uh, health facilities uh, are extremely uh, uh, poor, if not absent. And uh, the, 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 in general, the infrastructural, uh, the infrastructural uh, uh, landscape is extremely uh, um, poor. We shall not talk about uh, the job provision by governments since uh, during the last 30 years, the, the progressive withdrawal of state functions in the area uh, has led uh, has led many of the local dwellers to uh, rely on informal uh, on informal economic activities, which uh, which form the overwhelming majority of the uh, um, of the economic production uh, in the Lake Chad Basin. Moreover, uh, something which we shall keep in keep in mind is that um, the Lake Chad Basin area being divided between four different administrations with different origins. Uh, um, uh, occasioned uh, several occur uh, several contentions over uh, natural resources management. So uh, about land access, land inheritance, uh, land tenure, uh, access to fishing waters, and uh, most importantly, um, the existence or presence of herding corridors for uh, livestock. In this kind of uh, social space, uh, ISWAP, or as, uh, as many local dwellers call it, uh, simply Al-Daula or the state, uh, 
uh, has come to uh, introduce himself itself and uh, and uh, to to integrate uh, with a certain degree in uh, in uh, local uh, social social in the local social space and uh, in the economic uh, production. As uh, as also Vidas has uh, recorded for um, the uh, Al Qaeda and uh, Caliphate affiliates in Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, uh, the main um, the main way through which uh, the Islamic State West Africa province in Lake Chad is able to um, to enjoy legitimacy is through uh, a progressive hijacking of local grievances. So uh, it mostly operates as a local insurgency. Is uh, Iswap was able to uh, uh, to use at his advantage uh, the political cleavage between uh, central governments in uh, Niger, Nigeria, Cameroon, and Chad, uh, and this extremely peripheral area, uh, which somehow seems isolated from the rest. And uh, this ability, as uh, as as translated in. Uh, in a progressive integration in uh, land uh, in land rights uh, conflicts and uh, disputes over trading, fishing, and grazing rights, because um, it posed as a as a negotiator, as a broker, and then it became also a proper economic actor really um, uh, in the area. He was able to do this uh, thanks to the rhetoric of social justice and um, the legitimacy of, uh, uh, of Sharia abiding practices. Because we have to remember that since this, the World Lecture Basin used to be part of the, of the most ancient Islamic kingdom and empire in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, uh, where, um, uh, where the, the, the conduct of Islam is, uh, is is extremely present in the daily life, in the day-to-day -day activities of, of single citizens, of, of, of local dwellers. Uh, it was uh, it was important for them to um, it was important for them to uh, to pose as a legitimate Islamic actor. Uh, practically speaking, uh, the the governance model adopted by ISWAP was uh, was based on mobility or what I called uh, a roaming governance. Uh, they they decided not to invest in um, in territorial control, uh, which implies territorial defense, which is extremely costly, and instead decided to uh, provide governance on the spot when request. And uh, therefore, uh, justice administration uh, is um, is uh, is provided only when disputes arises and uh, um, yeah, forms of uh, uh, building sanitation facilities or um, or, uh, or building madrasa uh, schools and madrasa it's uh, it occurs only when uh, when is somehow request or uh, when the 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 locals the local dwellers um, ask for this provision um but um, as we said before, um, a tentative analysis of how ISWAP exercises influence in the area, um, as we said, is uh, is uh, is mostly dependent on the on the on the waning legitimacy, uh, the decreasing legitimacy of traditional um, Islamic teachers, which in the area are called uh, Malamai or Guniwa, and. Uh, and uh, they, uh, this the later Islamic uh, traditional Islamic teachers in the area are perceived as uh, proxies or allies of the corrupt central political power, and so they um, they are seen as uh, lacking the proper legitimacy to administer justice according to uh, to proper principles, to proper Sharia abiding principles. While uh, while uh, Iswap uh, stress of the removal of un-Islamic practices, which are uh, which occur uh, in vast numbers in uh, in the area, so uh, polytheism or uh, amulet making um, has helped Iswap to pose as a as a as a modern form of Islam uh, with regards uh, if confronted with the. With the the kind of of Islam which is practiced practiced uh, by traditional Malamai and Guniwa, 
Moreover, uh, and most importantly, in, on practical terms, is that uh, ISWAP was able to create somehow a healthy trading environment for economic actors to operate, uh, providing the minimal level of security, uh, which otherwise they would not enjoy in, uh, in territories administered by JIS or Boko Haram, or, uh, or, even, the, or, or even in the territories uh, administered by the Nigerian, uh, Chadian, Nigerian and Cameroonian states. Uh, talking uh, about how ISWAP was able to recruit and create bonds uh, on the material level, uh, it engaged in the policy of microloans uh, for, for young people, which are not endowed with, uh, with forms of capital and, uh, and, uh, and the four phase uh, marginalization because they are not able to secure a household, uh, to, uh, to, to have a wife, and uh, they are uh, intermittently employed in the informal market, and um, and therefore they, they they are not even able to 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 get a motorbike. And so this policy of microloans um, helped materially for these young people to to get uh, integrated into the economic network of uh, Lake Chad. On the, discursive, on the discursive level, ISWAP employed uh, a narrative of redemption, social justice, emancipation, equality based on the Sharia, on Islam. And, uh, and for many social actors in the area, um, getting, uh, getting closer to, the, to, to, to ISWAP, uh, to ISWAP activities, so to jihadi activities, was a form also to exercise um, their agency, their, their, their personal agency and to dismantle um, uh, the, the image of marginalization uh, which, which prevents them from gaining social uh, respectabilities. Concluding, um, we, can, we have seen as, uh, as uh, Iswapo, the, the, the West African wilaya of the Caliphate, was able to convey to a political and religious framework um, uh, the exercise of alternative modes of governance presented in an Islamically licit way. And in the end, we can, we can say that uh, after, after several years researching on that and, um, and a couple of stints of fieldwork in the area, uh, the al-Dawla or uh, the Islamic State presents as, a, as a, an alternative Islamic modernity for discontent social actors which um, which resent of the state capability to, 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 to care for them. And uh, this is our, the concluding remarks. I thank you everyone for, uh, for having listened. And uh, this is it. Okay, thank you so much, Alessio, for, for the great presentation. Uh, we'll now, we're a bit over time, but since uh, most of you are able to leave on <laughs> uh, as, as you wish, uh, we'll, we'll move over to the Q&A and try to get through as many questions as possible. We've received a lot of interesting questions uh, and we'll just do it the democratic way and go by the popular vote. That means that we should start with a question from Anonymous, um, he asks, uh, this goes to the both of you, I, I, I uh, presume, uh, do these groups, uh, have, have they established a form of state like uh, the Islamic state, what, what's known as a proto-state in, in, in the literature? How do they secure their fundings? So, um, Alessio, uh, do you have a, an, an answer to that question? Well, uh, as, I, as I briefly mentioned during my uh, presentation, um, the kind of governance was, that was established, established by Islamic State, West Africa province and Lake Chad was not a proper governance as we, as we, as we may think about it. Uh, it's a kind of mobile or roaming one, which, is, um, which does not imply territorial control. So uh, if this is uh, what, the, what, the, what, what the question uh, is about, uh, I, I, would, I would say that they do not have established a form of state like uh, the al-Dawla did in Syria. 
Uh, well, about the fundings, um, I have to say that 99% of, uh, of uh, Islamic State West Africa province is self-reliant, and uh, the, the, the issue of funding coming from the, the Daesh Central or from Daula is, um, is a extremely debated, and uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a matter of lesser importance here. Uh, thank you, Alessio. Uh, Vito, uh, do you have any uh, any comments to to uh, that question? Yeah, well, I, I think the situation in the Central Sahel is is um, quite similar to what Alessio uh, sketches out for uh, for, for Lake Chad. Um, so neither group uh, prior prioritizes holding territory in, in the Central Sahel, um, and um, but, but that said, they, they, they also have this, this kind of roaming governance where they are, are able to, to, um, to administer some form of justice and, and providing some, uh, some social order. Um, uh, but, but they do not invest the resources in actually keeping a territory and, and, um, uh, and creating a state as, as, we, as we saw in, in, um, in Northern Mali in, in 2012. Uh, that was a costly experiment. They, but, and, um, I think to realize that that the uh, that they have to be more more cautious with uh, with that approach, uh, and um, I, I, and the fact that that the the um, the, the French operation by Barkhane and um, uh, and uh, and the um, UN peacekeeping mission is, is still stationed in Mali makes it makes it very difficult for them to to uh, to take the step. Uh, thank you, Vida. Um... Uh, we'll just continue with the question regarding the the um, situation for JNIM and the ISGS. Uh, Jan wonders uh, how relevant are the ethnic ethnicities and tribal affiliations in driving the conflict uh, and in ensuring or preventing group cohesion uh, for J JNIM and the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara. Um, the ethnic and tribal affiliations are definitely important. Um, I think, first of all, it's interesting to see what has happened over the, over the past, uh, let's say, 10 years, uh, where, where the, the jihadists, um, jihadists the, uh, the jihadist presence in northern Mali was still dominated by, um, by Arabs uh, from, from, uh, from Algeria and, and Mauritania and, and, and other places uh, in, in North Africa. Um, so it's interesting to see that they've, that they've managed to um, kind of become uh, indigenous in, in Mali and recruit from, from the Tuaregs and, and from the Fulani and from other, from other ethnic groups. Um, and um, so what is kind of surprising with J JNIM is that they've actually managed to to, uh, to to gather all these different katibas with uh, with uh, whose majority is from different ethnic groups within this uh, single uh, single organization. Um, and uh, the um, I, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, there are ethnic dimensions to to many other conflicts that that the jihadists are involved in, both. Um, in the case of Katiba Masina and 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 uh, JNIM, uh, you have especially the the, um, the conflicts between the Dogon and the and the Fulani in in the central Mali, where uh, JNIM has would say presented itself as the the, the champions of the of the Fulani cause. Uh, similarly, in the um, in the borderlands between Niger uh, Niger sorry and and Mali, uh, it, ISJS has tr uh, tried to assume a similar position. Um, uh, as a Fulani protective vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the uh, Dawsa Haq uh, Tuaregs, uh, so this is definitely an important um, an important aspect to to the whole conflict. Um, that said, uh, the issue of ethnicity or or, try, or trying to set one ethnic group against another is is always kind of awkward in in jihadi discourse because uh, um, the jihadists purport to be above. Uh, Ethnic and, and and tribal allegiance. Um, so, uh, 
so so being the champion of one ethnic group against another is it, it, always kind of difficult. Um, uh, and the jihadist groups are well. So Katiba Masina is dominated by Fulanis, and uh, and so is ISGS. Uh, but neither is um, ethnically ho homogenous. Um, uh, and uh, um, Amadou Kufa, the leader of Katiba Masina, has, um, although he has increased his um, his uh, um, emphasis on the Fulani aspects uh, of um, in, in recent speeches. Uh, it is still not uh, well. It's still, still not only a Fulani, uh, a Fulani movement. Thank you, Vita. Um, we'll just continue with another great question, uh, which is probably uh, hard to answer, but I'll 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 let you guys um, share your thoughts. Uh, Hannes wonders what motivates and sustains the actions of these groups. Is it really? ideology or rather opportunism, political representation, control of resources and economic participation. Alessio, uh, what's your thoughts on, on that in, in the region? OK, well, it's <laughs> it's the most intricate question and it's what, what is driving me, me, driving me to research about these groups. And uh, we can say that uh, the Hannes mentioned um, all, all, all good factors, all good elements in driving these insurgencies. Uh, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that uh, there is uh, one of these elements who plays the major role in uh, in driving the insurgency. I mean, uh, economic opportunism uh, it's it's just part of 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 uh, of living, and uh, and therefore they these groups have to have to manage some kind of um, of uh, material activities, and and so merge as I showed, integrate into pre-existing uh, socio-economic networks, and um, and economic and political alliances. Uh, political representation, I would say that it's the only thing which is uh, which is uh, uh, we, we, have, we have to discard this because uh, uh, since the emergence of these uh, jihadi Salafi groups, they are against secular states. Um, and as we have seen also for the case of Mali, it's extremely difficult to assess whether uh, um, the ongoing negotiation will be accepted by 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 the scholar uh, in the shura in the council, or uh, or even by 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 soldiers by foot fighters, and um, and uh, this because the negotiation is linked to the to the possibility of uh, the Malian state to eventually uh, adopt forms um, Sharia in the penal code uh, and in the, I think also in the civil code of, uh, of the Malian uh, legal system. Um, control of resources is something that is strictly connected to the, to the material opportunism of creating um, a, a wider base uh, of workforce for this group. And uh, I would I would say that uh, according to my own experience down there, um, the the reason driving many people to uh, to, part, to, uh, to to get recruited by these uh, these jihadi groups is that uh, through them um, they can they can enjoy some forms of economic uh, in economic integration in uh, in uh, in the economic system of the area. Because as we've shown, uh, many of those who uh, who, uh, who nowadays uh, in 2020 uh, get into GID groups are uh, are are people who are poorly endowed in terms of uh, of uh, capital, stricto sensu, uh, and uh, of social capital in in a broader sense. And therefore, uh, we, we can also say, reverting the question, that uh, it's people, local people, who is uh, uh, using uh, the, the the jihadi groups uh, to gain from the from the broader situation, and to gain access to some to somehow uh, somehow to um, more resources. Uh, I will I will leave the room to Vidar. Yes, Vida, uh, do you have any any thoughts? Is it is it ideology or is it greed or grievances that are driving the uh, um, jihadi insurgents? 
Well, I think Alessio's response is very good. Uh, it's it's difficult to kind of uh, extricate uh, extricate the various components. I mean, you will, it will always be one part. Uh, I mean, people are partly motivated by ideology, uh, um, and partly motivated by by grievances. Um, so. Uh, well, I mean, Alessio's position. This is uh, this is one of the reasons this um, area is uh, fascinating to to research. Okay, uh, we'll move on to. I'll I'll try to group a couple of questions that um, brings the the epidemic that have uh, forced us online uh, <laughs> into the picture here. Austin Davis wonders, will the COVID-19 epidemic have an impact on the conflict uh, uh, with regards to the poor response by the state and withdrawal of international actors and therefore a blossoming space for jihadi actions? Or will it, uh, on the other hand, could it also reduce the legitimacy, legitimacy of jihadis uh, in, if they fail to, to respond to, to the virus? Um, connected to that, question is a question by Shetl Fred Hansen. Um, there's there's the reports of, of French soldiers in, in the Barkhane force uh, being infected by COVID-19. Do you know if this is true? And if yes, uh, is the former question even more pressing? Yes, that was to me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, look, first of all, to the last question, I can't say I've, I've uh, read that yet, but that, that might well be. Um, it is very difficult to gauge what is going to happen because we still know so little about the virus. We, we have uh, we have no clue how long we're going to be, be sitting here in, in Norway and stuck in our own homes. Uh, so, um, of course, the details are going to be difficult to determine. Um, that said, I think. Um, I do think the latter scenario that Austin Davis uh, has um, sketched out is uh, is not very likely. I, I, I don't think the um, I, I don't think the states are, are in a position to to strengthen their own legitimacy in in uh, in this situation. Um, I, I mean um, th that would um, I, I guess entail that they have a very effective response to to uh, to the the COVID epidemic, uh, which are, which is is highly unlikely due to the uh, deficiencies in um, in both um, general governance and and in the the, um, the health apparatus of all of these different countries. Um, so uh, I, I I think it's more likely that we'll open up uh, uh, that uh, the. I can't see the question anymore, but uh, um, that will more open up for for, for increased jihadist presence. But uh, again, it's, it's very difficult to to know how how the virus itself is going to to affect the whole region. Alessio, do you have any anything to add uh, when it comes to the Lake Chad basin? Uh, well, uh, not 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 so. Not so important, I guess, but um, I know that the official position of the Islamic State is that uh, the, the virus uh, is a punishment of God, of course, for uh, infidels and uh, unbelievers. And uh, therefore, they are, they, are, they are moving fast forward to, to, um, to gain something from the world situation because they know that local governments won't, would, would not be able and actually do not have the capacity to uh, to uh, to provide an efficient and comprehensive uh, um, healthcare system for all the citizens affected. Uh, because we shall also remember that uh, the COVID is the last problem in many of these uh, Sahelian countries uh, which face uh, enduring forms of other sicknesses and diseases. And um, but uh, I personally am skeptic uh, regarding the possibility for uh, uh, caliphate affiliates in the area, whether uh, the Greater Sahara or uh, the West Africa province, to provide a more effective uh, response in terms of healthcare uh, facility uh, to local population. Um, as I said before, uh, the, the, they were able to provide some scattered um, sanitation uh, to in, in rural areas, but I, I can see that it's uh, extremely hard for them to provide um, uh, antibiotics. I mean, 
Otherwise, uh, we know that uh, they are, uh, at least West Africa province and JIS uh, or Boko Haram, they have um, they have good links in the um, in the in the smuggling uh, in the smuggling corridor uh, from uh, from the ports of uh, of southern Nigeria and, uh, and Cameroon, so they uh, are potentially able to uh, to intercept some of the um, of the of the medical supplies coming into the ports, into the uh, through the ships. Uh, but uh, matters of transportation uh, and uh, the high cost of doing that, I don't know if it is, it is this is a really attractive option for them. Uh, regarding the, the 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 COVID, which has affected uh, several Balkan forces, I uh, which was posed by Ketil, uh, I am not sure that uh, um, that the number is so high. But uh, a couple of sources have uh, have confirmed that uh, so. As, uh, uh, for now, they are sure that uh, there is some kind of, uh, of diffusion of the virus among the Barkham forces. Uh, but I want to wait until uh, the most reliable sources that I have will, uh, will confirm that. OK, thank you, Alessio. Um, we've gone way past our time, but since uh, there are so many great questions, we'll we'll tackle two or three more just to uh, to uh, get some some more brilliant insights from our presenters. Um, Sharif asks, what's the potential for Sahel groups to start targeting countries that have so far been largely unaffected by the AQ militancy in recent years, such as Algeria and Mauritania? Uh, Vidar, do you have any any thoughts on on that? Yeah, well, uh, I think it is less likely that, that they will strike, uh, strike Algeria and Mauritania than, than other countries in the region. Um, so uh, I think, think the general tendency has been for the jihadists to, to strike where they can find a weak target. Uh, and, um, and well, Algeria has long has long been a target for uh, for groups based in the Sahel because they've um, because of these groups have, have in turn derived from from AQIM's networks in in Algeria and and, is, um, um, and JNIM itself has also sworn um, sworn allegiance to to uh, AQIM leader uh, Abdel Malik Tukten. So so. Well, but I, th I think in later years, when the when the jihadist uh, movement in, in in the Sahel has become let's say more more indigenized, I, th I think this uh, this emphasis that you've seen previously on uh, or, or, on attacking Algeria has probably weakened. Um, and um, um, and Algeria is probably a, um, I mean due to the the, um, the the strength of the the uh, Algerian security apparatus, I think. I think it's more likely that, that you will see a southward uh, movement uh, toward towards the, co the coastal countries of uh, of um, uh, of West Africa, um, I, and I think this co connects in some way to. I saw another question uh, here as well that asked why JNIM uh, moved southward to 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 central Mali and, and Burkina Faso uh, because uh, so uh, someone asked. Uh, wasn't as the, the goal for for JNIM. Um, again, I think this is this is all about opp opportunism. Uh, um, the so let's say the, the ideology of global jihad isn't necessarily that connected to to one territory. Um, so, so the jihadist groups pulled pulled out from uh, or, or established themselves in northern Mali because they were uh, were under severe pressure in Algeria in the first place. Um, uh, and it seems now that that the um, that the that the tactic, uh, as um, as Yahya Abu Hamam, one of the one of the previous AQM commanders, he, uh, said it himself uh, himself that the that the reason for their um, uh, trying to expand the the uh, the geographic spread to central Mali and Burkina Faso was precisely just to try and spread the French forces as much as possible. Um, so. Uh, they, they they strike where, where they where they perceive an opportunity where they perceive an opportunity to to do so. Thank you, Vida. Um, we'll go to uh, Anne Katrina's uh, question. Uh, this is uh, uh, for you, Alessio. Rumor has it that those defecting from 
um, uh, from uh, JNIM to the um, Islamic State and Greater Sahara do so because they're getting paid more. Uh, what is known about the financial strength of the two groups? This, this, uh, how does this question fit into the to the the context uh, you presented in your presentation and in the Lake Chad uh, basin? Well, um, yes, this rumor, are, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, they are true because um, I mean the 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 financial capability of uh, of uh, the caliphate uh, local affiliate in the in the in the, in the three border region uh, we know that it's better uh, compared to the to the Sunim or to the to the al qaeda faction and um, we we also have to keep in mind that uh, these groups have so much integrated and merged into uh, local disputes and um, and uh, local infightings between between uh, as as Vidar said uh, um, uh, ethnic groups but also security and defense forces from different countries. So uh, I want to say that uh, lo lots of local dwellers. Uh, may may one brother may go to to the Jinim, to the Al Qaeda affiliate, and uh, and try to see how it's working there. If they are able to retaliate against the, the 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 injustice they faced so far in their life, while another brother may go to the to the Greater Sahara uh, only because they get paid more and he has no interest in uh, in in terms of social justice or whatsoever. So. I I don't want to get into the mind of these people um, because it's 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 an impossible objective, but um, but yes, uh, if the, if the question is just about the rumors about uh, the financial capability of I, uh, of the Caliphate affiliate in the border zone, I would say that uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I I feel to support this uh, this this statement. Um, in, indeed, the Caliphate's affiliate uh, can rely on some more financial resources, also because, as I mentioned, uh, they are able to provide also uh, microscopic loans uh, to um, uh, to local people, and um, and this makes the difference. And, and back back to the, the the core of the question, uh, Jay and I am, and 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 the Islamic Strait in Great Sahara. What's your uh, impression of of that rumor? Is it true that people defect from from Al Qaeda to the Islamic State because of financial uh, uh, strength of of the organization? Well, uh, uh, sorry, that that was directed at uh, at uh, Vida. Uh -huh. Uh, I, I think Alessio covered a lot of it well. Uh, I'm, I haven't seen exactly that room myself, but uh, th there are numerous reasons why, why people can uh, defect from one from one group to another. Um, another reporter said it, it is because of um, that, that some people are unhappy with with Ahmed Kufa's hand, handling of uh, of the, um, the traditional rights in uh, in, in the Mopti region. Uh, so, so so there are several several. Uh, reasons why th why this might happen. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, th th this issue of, of uh, funding and financing is um, uh, could probably be one of them, but um, I, I wouldn't reduce the whole uh, I wouldn't reduce the whole issue to that. With that, we will have to. We're almost half an hour uh, over our uh, scheduled time, so with that, we will have to to uh, we'll have to stop. Uh, I would like to thank, um, uh, on behalf of Nupi and the consortium, I would like to thank the presenters for for great presentations and and great answers to to the many great questions we received from from the audience today. Uh, I hope uh, those watching have have uh, have enjoyed and and. Uh, been able to to uh, follow the event uh, <laughs> despite my <laughs> limited production capabilities. Uh, I also like to to thank the communications department uh, and the the IT department here at Nupi for facilitating this webinar. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and we hope to see you again uh, at future webinars uh, on behalf uh, of the consortium. Goodbye.